Well, hello to all of you. And we are so excited to get our Aussie Live kicked off today, and it's great to have you joining us. Um, this session is our opening keynote, and that will be Lucy Gray. And we couldn't have a more perfect keynote to start us off for this amazing conference. So I'm going to let Lucy introduce herself as we get going. But the title of her session is All About Going Global, project-based learning with a global focus. So I know that's something we're all interested in hearing all about. We would like to take just a moment to say thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters. This conference would not be possible without them. So huge thanks to Adult Learning Australia, to the Australia E-Series, to Broadband for Seniors, and of course, to Steve Hargadon's Learning Revolution Project and Blackboard Collaborate. And we always like to start these sessions by finding out where all of you are located. So if you'll take just a minute to grab one of those smiley faces or globes and drag it to the map to show us where you're located. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Lucy is in Chicago, Illinois. And I see several smiling faces emerging on Australia. You are our shining stars. Excellent. And thank you for typing in the chat what your actual location is, because sometimes our smiley face is still a very big area. And it looks like we may have someone from Canada, which is totally awesome. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Lucy, who's going to say hello and get us going with her. Good morning to you. everyone down under. I am so happy to be here. Uh, I'm Lucy Gray, and I'm going to be talking at a rather rapid pace for the next hour. So um, hang on to your hat, and hopefully uh, you'll learn a lot and have a lot to share as well during the course of this keynote. Um, I am a consultant right now. I used to be a classroom teacher. I taught little people for a long time and then middle school computer science. And then about five years ago, I leapt into the world of consulting and uh, have never looked back. I really enjoy the variety of work that I do. I wear lots of hats. And one of those hats is my global hat that I'm, that I'm donning today. Uh, so this is a little bit about me, but I'm more interested in talking about project-based learning and going global than I am in, interested in talking about myself. All the resources that we are going to be covering um, are located in Edmodo. Edmodo is the perfect platform for going global and for connecting with other teachers. And you can go to this link here. Uh, and I also, um, I should probably put that link in the chat. That might help. Um, let me see if I can do that really quickly. I'll, I'll do that in a little bit when we, <coughs> when we have a break during the video. And you can join the group and actually participate with the group code there. Um, if you go to edmodo.com and log into your account and you click on join, if you put that code in, it will take you into this Edmodo group that I'm using for lots of different presentations this spring around global. So you'll see other people who are actually in there who are not necessarily from this conference. And I'm hoping that people will kind of connect and collaborate and comment on things in there. So feel free to post your own thing in there, answer some of the questions I have in there, and dig through the resources that are posted in this Edmodo group. I have posted a PDF of these slides, and the links should be clickable in that PDF as well. So don't feel like you madly have to write everything down because I've posted um, the resources in this Edmodo group. Uh, if you don't want to join the Edmodo group it's, itself, there is a tiny URL for it. It's a public link, and you can see everything there as well. So I've made this Edmodo, public, uh, this Edmodo group public so that anyone can join in pretty easily. Okay? So I will post the stuff again once we watch the video, and, uh, and then you guys can dig into that as well. I think I also might have posted it when I first joined the room, too. It might be up in the chat as well. So anyway, I'm excited to be here, and I hope that you'll find this useful. 
and that you'll uh, you'll contribute in the chat and share resources and we'll go from there. So I think um, if you're in Australia right now, it's probably pretty early where you are. And I thought maybe we would take a moment to kind of get in the mood for going global. I do this with a couple of different videos and we're just going to show one today. Um, this video is by Casey Neistat, who is an American filmmaker. And uh, in this video, he was um, paid by Nike to make a, a, a commercial about their fuel band. And instead, he took that money and with his best friend, friend ran around the world, literally, um, till their money ran out. And this video um, is a great example of, of kind of simple filmmaking. It's an example of how maybe you could do something with your classroom, um, you know, mimicking this maybe and, and splicing video clips together. Um, it's kind of interesting cultural commentary to it too. So without further ado, I am going to paste that link in here and you may need to click on it in order to um, see the video and hopefully this will get you up and rolling this morning. Oops. All right, so let's make every moment count of this keynote and uh, talk a little bit more about what we about uh, project-based learning. There are a couple other videos that I typically show, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. Um, you may have seen these ones where this guy dances around the world um, in all different places. He did this. His name is Matt, and he did it in 2006, 2008, 2012. And then I had a baby, and I think he must have been homebound for a while because he's starting back again to do this, I believe. And as he's, he's gone through all these different machinations of these videos, he's made them more collaborative with groups. And if you go to his website, um, sometimes he announces where he's going to be and that sort of thing. I'm not sure what the current status is of this. But these are also videos that I encourage people to look at because I think they're inspiring and they get people excited about the world and curious about the world. And that's where all this starts. I think you have to be curious about your situation. So 
typically I start out with kind of going through why you want to do all this and that gets kind of boring. And I want to start, I want to cut this time to the fun stuff and tell you about a project that has been really impressive to me. And I want to kind of de deconstruct it a little bit and, and tell you why I think it's an effective project. Um, people can design their own projects, which I think takes a certain level of sophistication. But people can also join in projects that other people are doing. And so don't feel when you see this project like you have to design something like this. Uh, eventually, it would be great if you got to that stage. But you can always participate in things that people are doing um, around the world, like Carolyn Skiba and Mary Morgan Ryan, who are from my corner of the world. They are in Illinois. Carolyn is a, fair, uh, now a fellow Apple Distinguished Educator and teaches at an Apple Distinguished School called Burley School in Chicago. And Mary Morgan Ryan is at another Apple Distinguished School in the suburbs of Chicago. And they decided they wanted to do a project together uh, based on a book, If You Lived Here. And they entitled it, If You, if you Learned Here. And so the link is in here. It's also in our Edmodo group. And you can feel free to explore it. I also wrote a piece in Medium recently um, explaining why I thought this project was really great. And I also linked to a presentation that they did for my conference, the Global Education Conference. And I think it's the ideal kind of project uh, in terms of engaging people, providing structure, and that sort of thing. And we'll get into that in a minute. So about 75 schools from around the world participated in this project last year. And Mary Morgan and uh, uh, Mary and Carolyn particularly sought schools from all over the planet. They didn't want it to be completely US centric. And I think they were actually kind of particular about um, how many how many schools they let into this from different parts of the world. And so I think at the end of the number that ended up being it was about 75 schools. And they used a couple of different tools. And one of them was Flipgrid, which is a web-based tool. It's also an app for your iPad. And it's free if somebody creates a Flipgrid. But you have to, if you want to create a Flipgrid, you have to pay, uh, I think it's a, I don't know, $30, $40 subscription per year, US dollar per, um, a subscription per year to actually make one of these flip grids. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. They put all these um, schools into different cohorts by color. So you weren't in one big, huge group of 75 uh, other schools. You were in a smaller group that they um, put you into. And I think that was really smart uh, to organize it this way. So in their flip grids, um, they would respond to like a weekly prompt about their learning community. It could be about you know, what the classrooms looked like or what they were reading. And they did this for maybe six weeks, I think. And this is what Flipgrid looks like on the web. And I took a screenshot of one of their Flipgrids. The teacher or the person creating the grid can have, makes a, a question, either a video question or a text question. So you can see. Um, down below, I think that's how they, they formed it. It's not really a question, but they asked, they told people exactly what they needed to do. And then the participants would click on this green um, plus sign to the left hand side of the screenshot. And they would record themselves responding to the prompt. And the nice thing about Flipgrid is that you can only record for a minute 30 seconds or so. And so you don't, you don't get like 10 minute videos here and you have to listen to all of them. It's pretty short and sweet. And so these are all videos that have, um, classes around the world have contributed to this particular grid. Okay. So this is one tool that they used. You could do this. What was great about this is that you could do it either in real time or not in real time. You didn't have to be in the same time zone online like we are right now. Uh, you could do it whenever your class was meeting. So that was another bonus to this. Another tool that they use, which is free, is Padlet. And I think many of us probably know about Padlet. Uh, it's a tool that lets you stick, uh, put up digital sticky notes. And again, these were correlated to weekly activities. So in week one, they talked about their classrooms and what it looked like. And you can see uh, that each school put their name of their school on the title and then went into great detail about what their classrooms look like. And I see one on the right-hand side of the screenshot where it's in French and in English, which is kind of cool. So they have, it looks like people from Estonia and Iceland and New York and Michigan and New Zealand. Um, in this particular uh, 
part of the screenshot were participating. So this is one tool where they shared information about their learning environment with other people in the, um, in the cohort. And the I Love Palette, too, I think it's one of the most robust tools out there. So they did those kinds of activities that didn't take a lot of time, um, allowed for asynchronous participation, allowed the kids to kind of get to know each other and where they were in the world. And they may have had a map, too, to kind of help everybody plot where, where the schools were. Um, but their culminating project was a global ebook, and they used the app Book Creator, um, which is available for Android or iPads. And it is, there's a free version that lets you create a couple books, I think, and then there's a, a paid version. And I highly, I think it's one of the most robust iPad tools you can have. Um, you can do so much with this in, in, in general. So uh, it's worth the investment if you do buy the paid version. Anyway, each classroom, you know, designed pages of what their, what it, lo what it looked like to learn in their environment. And they sent those pages to Mary and to Carolyn, and they combined them and made a global ebook. So you can go to their website and download this, and you can see, um, you don't have to have an iPad, you don't have to have an iPad necessarily to read this, you have to have an EPUB reader, and they give you some examples of things that you can, you can look at it with. Um, so anyway, this is, I think this is kind of a really cool collaborative, uh, cumulative project that they had at the end. They also did some hangouts on air here and there while they were meeting together over the course of the six weeks or so that this project took place. And um, and so I think it's important to have, you know, kind of an ending, an opening and ending celebration of some sort in order to bring some closure to the project. So that's this project that, that I think is really ideal, that is, it's, it's fun, it's easy, it can be tied to the curriculum. Um, and it doesn't have to take over your whole life when you're trying to run a classroom and, and, and do other things. So these are some of the elements that I thought that made this really effective. Um, they planned ahead, and they're actually planning right now for their second cohort. And they're looking uh, for people not outside the United States. They have a lot of United States participants. They, they're looking specifically to broaden their horizons. So if you're interested, go to their website. You can Google it or use the links in Edmodo and uh, send them a message because they're looking for people who are, are you know, outside the United States. Um, give your project some structure. It doesn't need to go forever. Um, it, you need to be mindful of people's time constraints and that sort of thing. So, you know, think about a beginning, a middle, and the end. Uh, think about, um, you know, kind of spelling out the expectations for participants. What do people need to do? in order to participate and give really explicit directions. So I think I just think that uh, it, it encourages people to um, know if a project is, is, is going to fit into what they're doing in the classroom, and it also minimizes, you know, potential for people to dro dropping out of a project. Um, you need a digital home base. You need a website. You need whatever it is that you're going to collect all your materials in and distribute to people. It could be Edmodo. It could be a Weebly site. It could be whatever. But you need a place that everybody can join in together. You need to communicate consistently to the people that you're working with. And you need to leverage social media in order to communicate about your project, but also maybe to get participants into whatever you're doing. Uh, I think it's also important to make it interdisciplinary so that it appeals to um, lots of different kinds of curriculum. And, you know, give some students some voice and choice in this. What are they, how do they... How do they get involved with this on a personal level? Think about that. And then we want to kind of go, encourage people to go beyond like food fests and, and, and kind of, you know, simple activities that relate to uh, understanding other cultures. It's important, but how do we deepen the learning? How do we make it more actionable? Um, I think this is a question that you need to ask yourself as you move along this kind of progression of, of diving into project-based learning. And then, as I mentioned before, I think it's important to have some sort of kind of ending celebration um, that allows for the kids to really uh, be happy about what they've accomplished. So that's just one project that I think exemplifies the possibilities out there. It's not the only one out there, but we're going to kind of dig into some more in a little bit. But I want to show you a little bit about the context and why this is important and, and ask, actually, I'd like to know I'd like to know a little bit more about the Australian perspective in, in comparison to what I'm going to talk about next. So these are, these are some kind of US-specific things right now that I'm going to talk about. Um, 
but hopefully hopefully there'll be some application you can tell me what you feel is is comparable in the United States so just to give you a little bit of a background if you don't know what I do in when I'm wearing my global hat I run the global education conference which is along with Steve Harganon it's a, um, a three or four day long event that takes place like this every November during International Education Week and Anne and Peggy in the, in the audience have been our loyalist supporters and Carol's been part of this and so many other people have been part of this. It's been so much fun and it's been wonderful getting to know the people that work in this community. Um, I, I, it's been life changing. So this is our community. It's globaleducationconference.com. It's in Ning, just like your uh, Australian one, your Aussie Live. We have about 23,000 members from about 160 countries. Lots of discussions that you can search through blog posts we've got we encourage people to list events in our events section and then we also have affinity groups where I don't know how active they are right now but they are there if people want to jump into them this event is completely free it's online we try to go around the clock and the best part about this is that when I'm going to bed you all are waking up down in Australia and so thank God for Ann Merchant and Sue Wyatt and everybody else who comes, who comes on board to moderate so that moderate sessions that Steve and I can get some sleep because we're typically probably online from six or seven in the morning here till probably eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, um, you know, in our time zone. So we are really grateful to everybody that helps out during that week because otherwise we would be, um, you know, walking zombies. Um, all the sessions are recorded just like this conference and that sort of thing. It's great. Um, here's Pam Allen in 2011 who had just come back from, she runs Lit World and they do World Read Aloud Day, which you might be interested in. It's coming up soon. Uh, she had just come back from Rwanda working with kids. Um, she's an amazing human being. You know how the platform looks like, so I'm not going to go into that a little bit, but these are some examples. Uh, Julian Reed uh, um, is a, a tech director in Tennessee and volunteers with Polar Bears International. And they do webcasts from the Tundra Buggies um, in Churchill, Manitoba uh, through Polar Bears International. And so you might want to look up Tundra Connections and that's part of what Julian does. A couple, she's keynote for us twice, um, or keynote for us once, but um, the main scientist for Polar Bears International uh, keynoted our first year with Lance Ruggi from Discovery Education and they did it from the Tundra Buggy in Churchill, Manitoba. And they turned the webcam around so that you could see polar bears outside the tender buggy. It was the coolest thing ever. And then Julian did this one a couple years later. And Street, Google Street View had just been up on the tundra taking pictures, um, which were launched a couple weeks later uh, for International Polar Bear Day or something um, as part of Google's efforts with um, Google Maps and Google Earth. And of course, we have our very favorite Anne Merchant, who has been just tremendous in helping people. I just wrote an article about her, not because of this conference, but because I'm always continually inspired by Anne. She is the most generous, kind, patient uh, person I know um, who is really, you know, really helps people get started with projects. And she's a go-to person that I direct people to if they want to kind of see an exemplary, an exemplary, um, professionally generous person. So this is your go-to person if you want to get started and learn from her. I think Anne has probably done, I haven't done a count, but I was looking at all the, all the uh, archives of her work and she's done probably more sessions than anyone else, I would say, than any single person in our conference. So anyway, Anne, I, you're probably blushing right now and I'll stop, but we, we're really grateful for, for all of your work um, and I'm so glad I've gotten to, to actually see you in person too. That the Anne and I ran around New York one summer after ISTE and uh, it was great. So anyway, here are some of the keynotes that we've had um, over the years. Uh, another great, uh, these are from the past year. Uh, Will Piper and Pedro um, Arapacio, if I'm saying his name correctly, um, met in our conference five years ago and became friends. Uh, Will is near me in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Pedro is in Mexico, and they do all sorts of projects together. And they did a really energetic keynote this year that is also really good for teachers to see in terms of kind of practical application of global education in their classrooms. Um, I'm trying to think who else here was particularly great. You're, Julie Lindsay also keynoted for you, is keynoting for you this week too, so uh, you know Julie. Um, and then Henry Harbo, I'm kind of particularly 
fond of this story. Henry is uh, one of my, a former student of mine who I had as a middle school computer science student in when he was in fifth and sixth grade, and he's now 22 or 23. He's graduated from college here in the United States and has a social venture. Um, he's invented with um, friends from college this orange box that connects classrooms around the world. It can be polar, or not polar, solar powered or um, electrical powered, and it connects and it projects. So ideally, a, a school in the United States buys this device, and then they partner them with a school in India that's less fortunate, and that fee covers the device for the school in India. And they do video conferencing back and forth and that sort of thing. And they've developed a platform for leaving video messages, too. It's kind of cool. So this is a startup. It was, it was part of a, a, a Kickstarter campaign last spring, and they're trying to get it off, a grant, off the ground. And I'm particularly proud of Henry and excited that I've reconnected with him and his friends um, these many years later. It's very satisfying. So these are some of the keynotes that we've had in the past few years. We also have more events coming. We do a meetup at ISTE. We're doing a webinar series. Um, and then we're doing something called Global Leadership Week, which is going to take place uh, the week of April 25th. And I'd love to get you guys involved with that to do some events and have it listed on our calendar. Um, if you want to know about all of these, go to globaledevents.com. That's kind of a good starting place for that. So let's talk about what this looks like in terms of getting your school or district, I'm not sure what you call them down in Australia, but your, your, your region um, involved with global education. And in the United States, we've had a group called the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, which has been around a long time with this model of how um, content is still important, but you need to infuse soft skills into it in order to prepare kids for a new way of, of life. So this has been around for a while. And recently, um, <coughs> they uh, came out with a, a, a framework for state action on global education. And I don't really think this is necessarily um, geared towards states. To me, it's something that I would use if I were in a leadership level in a school or district. But these are the kind of goals that they outline here in detail. And I think this could be applicable to any country that is trying to value global citizenship and um, prepare kids for a, a new and changing world. So these are some of the kind of talking points from that. There is a teacher's guide that goes with it that's excellent. So if you're looking for curriculum ties, um, this will give you specific teacher information to see how it maps to what you're already doing in the classroom. In, our, in, in the case here, it might be a little bit um, common core related, which is obviously not applicable down, down under, uh, but this gives you an idea of what the goals are and the objectives are for students um, from, you know, little kids to big kids. Um, this is what it looks like in grade six through eight. And this kind of maps to the Asia Society's work around global competence. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. And the Asia Society is a member of this coalition now as well. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you talk about in, in a globalized curriculum. Um, and they also believe in teachers being globally ready that teachers need to be globally competent. And that does not necessarily mean that you're a world traveler. It means that you understand the world, are curious about the world, you investigate the world. And I don't think that necessarily means that, you, obviously, being someplace um, is really pivotal. But in this day and age, I'm not sure it's always practical for people. So I think it's really important to talk about um, if we're going to create globally ready students, we do need to also create globally ready teachers. Uh, this is kind of the seminal uh, publication that I point people to from the Asia Society, which has done a lot um, around education. Their Partnership for Global Learning um, invited uh, Anne and I and Julie, Lindsay, and Steve Hargadon to their conference a few years ago in New York. And they have developed a free ebook, and I just learned that they're developing another one. They're, either they're updating this or they're writing a new book. Um, that talks about the idea of global competence. And my understanding of global competence is that there are four pillars, and it's a little bit, uh, it's less nebulous than global awareness. And the four pillars are investigate the world, recognize pers perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. Um, I don't think this is on top of everything. I think this is on top of everything that we do that can be integrated into uh, the, the buzzwords that are going around education now. And in the United States, we're, we're throwing around STEM a lot. We're throwing around college and career readiness here. We're throwing you know, th those kinds of terms. And, and these things can be integrated artfully into those 
initiatives and priorities, I think. That's my feeling on it. But anyway, I encourage you to download this book if you want to know more about this. It's a little bit more concrete than saying we want students to be globally aware. We want kids to be globally ready and be able to take global action where they need to because uh, they're going to be graduating from school and working across borders to solve complex problems that, um, you know, right out of the box. They're not going to be, um, or maybe they're already doing it in school. You never know. So that's what we mean about being globally ready, is being ready to take on the challenges that the world is facing. Recently, UNESCO came out with something about global citizenship, too, which may be useful as you and your school kind of plan your approach to developing globally competent students. So let's take a minute here, um, and I'm going to pop up my chat window so I can see the chat a little bit better. Um, what initiatives, I'm curious, are going on in Australia around global education? Is there anything similar to this? Um, and, Julie, and Julie's book is coming out. That's true. Peggy, at, it's in April, I believe Julie Lindsay's new book is coming out, and she's, in, she's interviewed over 130 global leaders. Um, so that's going to be, I think, really important and pivotal to all, pivotal to all this. But is there anything going on with the Australian government that is um, that's, that's kind of developing policies and procedures for to encourage this kind of teaching and learning? I'm, I'm curious from from your perspective if you want to share in the chat. Is there do we know anything? All right, raise your hand and we'll give you the mic. Um, Peggy, can you give them the mic? Because I'm and, and I'm. Uh, struggling here. I have too many windows open and so on and so forth. I think somebody raised Yeah, that hand. was Ness me. Um, we have something called the Asia Education Foundation. Um, it's not it's it's developed it's originally okay. developed through the <coughs> excuse me, the government. Um, and it's supported by the government. So that's one option, particularly there's all, uh, in the Australian curriculum, there's a particular um, link towards Asia and it's enga Australia and its engagement with Asia. So that's a, a really important link. Um, that's one I know of. Um, I'm not sure about other um, government initiatives. Okay. In, in, my, in my understanding, too, in Australia, that the relationship between Australia and Asia is really, really important, that there's a lot of movement between places and, and understanding of that. And I, remember, I think I remember this from um, my friend Wesley Field, who taught at MLC in Sydney. And I want to say that they had a lot of programs when he taught there um, that related to global awareness and that sort of thing. So that makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. Okay. All right, so I think this is important. You know, I, 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 as much as I try to not have a completely U.S.-centric perspective on this, it, it occurred to me um, while we were planning this Global Leadership Week that's coming up that it's still very U.S.-oriented, you know, and, and I'm not aware of what specific initiatives are going on in different countries. I think in the United States, there's certain states that are kind of taking the lead, but it's not across the board by any means. It is not a priority. And we want it to be more of a priority. So our Global Leadership Week thing that's coming up, we want to elevate that conversation and get people more on board to say it's important. The other thing that I meant to put in my slides that I forgot is, I don't know if you've seen the new ISTE standards for students that they are proposing. They're not adopted yet, but they're proposing they're in draft form. One of them is for students to become global collaborators. So I think that's going to be really, really, really important. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of touch on that and, and see where you guys were with it, and we can, let's move on to the fun stuff. Okay, so projects. Let's talk about project things, um, starting places for where you can find partners and join existing things if you don't want to design something yourself. And I have a pilot going for all these projects, that, or all these presentations I'm doing this spring, where people can go and add their project. Um, it's padlet.com slash LMNS slash global project. And you're more than welcome to go and add anything that you're doing currently. But let me show you a few other things um, that are important in, in this realm. I think it's important to start with pedagogy. And I know that down under, you guys are, are known for being very strong in this area. So this may be redundant to you, but I just want to cover this a little bit. Um, the Buck Institute in the United States is kind of considered the project-based learning in place. 
They are, um, they provide lots of professional development online. They used to do, and I don't know if they still do, great hangouts on air every week about, um, about different aspects of project-based learning. They also have a whole national faculty that goes and does professional development places. And many of those faculty members come from High Tech High in San Diego, which is an amazing project-based learning high school in California. So um, this is a good place to start if you're not familiar with project-based learning um, or you want to learn more on how to deepen it. They also have a conference in June in Napa Valley, California. And they also have an online project planner um, that's part of their, their resources here. So I highly recommend um, I highly recommend taking a look at some of their materials and seeing how you can adopt them. The other model that has kind of intrigued me is another flavor of project-based learning, and this comes from Apple. And I'm going to take a little bit of a drink of water here. Um, <coughs> Challenge-based learning, I believe, is being retooled a little bit. And I don't know the, the history of this, but it was my sense that Apple developed this as a way of using their technology richly and deeply. But it's not particularly platform specific. It is like regular project-based learning, but there's more action um, built into it and there's more digital built into it. So the kids blog and record the reflections. Um, they create a problem, they identify a problem um, to be solved. They create some action steps towards it and they actually really try to tackle some, a real world or you know, a problem that is affecting either their community or someplace else. Um, so this is one model that I think has been particularly interesting that not many people, not everybody knows about, and I believe that they're retooling this. And I don't know when anything's going to come out about it, but my, my understanding is that there's going to be a new version of this coming at some point. And then underlying all of this, I think, is approach, an approach that we have really embraced here in the United States that comes from um, the company IDEO and the design school or D school at Stanford University, and that's design thinking. And again, it's a very it's, it's human-centered uh, approach to anything. Um, I've used it with adults to help them rethink like play and homework and that sort of thing in their schools. Um, but you can also use it with kids. And there's a toolkit as well. And I think this makes a really good context from a pedagogical perspective to bring in um, global. So let's talk about specific projects. Uh, there are a couple different approaches here. You can either integrate global lessons into your existing curriculum. That's one way. You can join existing projects that you don't run yourself, but um, maybe may match something that you're doing in your classroom, or you can design your own project. So there's different levels of sophistication with all of this, and you don't have to do all of this. I would suggest picking one thing and seeing how it works for you if you're new to this. So um, an example of places that have, have great lessons and content for you, this is one of our partners, the Global Oneness Project. Um, uh, Clary Von Lee is the education director for this. It's based in Northern California. And they, they work with photographers all over the world to create, to find images, and, and Clary and her team write lessons that go with them. It's completely free. Um, it's pretty amazing. So if you're looking for um, some topics that really explore um, you know, humanity, this is a, a good place to go. Another one that's been around for a long time, and I don't know if this would make sense in Australia or if it's going to make sense in the United States much longer because people are moving away from paper grocery bags. But this one has been in existence and is really easy to do. On April 22nd, which is Earth Day, um, you, you're supposed to, you're, or before that, you're supposed to go to your grocery store, ask for a stack of bags, then on Earth Day have your kids decorate them or before Earth Day, and then take them back to the grocery store so the grocery store can bag groceries on April 22nd and raise awareness. Um, on this site, the, the Mark Alnus, who has run this, collects uh, the numbers of bags that are, are decorated and any other kind of um, pictures or any other kind of artifacts related to people incorporating this project into their classrooms. Simple, basic, it's an easy win um, for people who might be a little bit reluctant. Another day that people really love, and I'm sure you guys in this audience know about it, is International Dot Day. Um, based on the book The Dot by Peter Reynolds. Um, it's always in September and it's about creativity and people joining in around the world. This is another, um, another really powerful, simple, a simple but powerful opportunity to see what other people are doing around the world. Uh, then we have our friend Jen Wagner who does projects all over the, all over the, all over the school year. 
mostly designed for younger students, pre-K, sixth grade. They're very simple, low barriers to entry. Uh, she has a remind group where she sends out uh, notifications when registrations are opening for various projects. So this is also a really good starting point if you um, are constrained by time and resources and that sort of thing. Flat Stanley, uh, hopefully you guys have read some of the Flat Stanley books out there. This is a project, there's an app for it, or you can use the website to um, to send, you know, to take upload pictures of Flat Stanley and so on and so forth. Um, this is kind of a fun thing to do um, in a classroom. Then this has been, um, Global Read Aloud has been an enormously popular project by a woman, run by a woman named Pernille Rip, who I think is a seventh grade teacher in Wisconsin. They use Edmodo as their home base, and um, they choose five or six books every year um, of varying levels, and you choose your book that you're going to read aloud with your students, and then you join these Edmodo groups and meet other teachers and decide on whether you're going to do a mystery Skype or other activities related to those books. Um, so take, make sure that you take a look at this. Um, it's pretty, it's not prescriptive. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity and, and, led, and, and leeway for um, kind of designing your own experience. Uh, a STEM-related one is um, looking at monarch butterflies as they travel from Mexico to the United States and you know, vice versa. This is from the Annenberg um, Foundation, which also does, I have to show this, I should have a slide for this. They also are, the, um, they also fund this site, which is explore.org. This is my favorite, favorite, favorite thing. Um, let me just show you this because I think it's so amazing. I don't know if this will, if I can do a web tour. Oh, uh, I'm having trouble pasting the link into the web tour for some reason. Anyway, go take a look at explore.org. There are webcams from all over the world. Um, some of them are seasonal. So you may see like beluga whales at a, t a particular time of the year or uh, buffalo at a particular time of the year. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. I love this. Um, so make sure that you take a look at explore.org, which is related to, to Journey North. Of course, there's Skype in the Classroom. I know Anne has been really involved with Skype in the Classroom and finding partners and lessons that will help you do uh, connect your, your classroom to another around the world. That's also a great starting point. Um, these are called mystery location calls. You can do Hangouts on Air. Uh, within the Google Plus community, there are tons of groups where they're facilitating this kind of thing. So, Make sure that you check out uh, Jerry Blumgarten's um, Mystery Location Call page for getting started with this. This is your how-to guide for everything related to um, mystery location calls. Uh, the other thing I want to mention about project-based learning is that it's important that you have friendships. It's important that you have a network and you're connected to people. And two people I've thought about over the past couple of years have been Lisa Parisi, who's in New York, and Donna Roman, who used to be near me outside Chicago and now works for Chicago Public Schools. And this is, you know, this blog is still up. It's a couple of years old. Um, in this particular blog post, um, um, let me see if I can pull up the link for you. Lisa uh, detailed all the different kinds of global things that they did throughout the year. And these activities were not done in isolation. They were done with other people because these teachers are active on social media and um, are willing to you know, reach out for with each other. So this is the link to that blog in particular. Um, but she's gone on, Lisa has gone on to work with other teachers and they have a wiki called Our Global Friendships and they do, you know, dance videos and they have this Rhino project and many of them come to the ISTE conference and meet each other and it's always fun to see what they're up to. Um, and I think they meet once a month on Skype and, and kind of hash out what they're doing together. I don't know what the status of uh, the Global Classroom Project is, because I know Michael Graffin is, has a, a, new, a new job, I think, this year or last year. So this has been another one that's been more Australian involvement, um, another community where you can meet people and find friends and, and collaborators. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, some more advanced kind of uses of technology that may help you with projects. This is, um, and I think it's been redesigned, this is Jerome Berg's Google Lit Trips. And this is not particularly collaborative, but it could be. He's taken um, Google Maps and Google Earth and created these tours of different books. Um, some are more multicultural than others. Um, and so that gives kids kind of a context for what's ha what was happening in that book. 
So I've seen him, there's one um, tour that you can download of the Kite Runner, which takes place in Afghanistan. Here's one that will cover you know, a lot of the material from the Holocaust. Um, and he's, impl he's put primary source materials into these place marks on these maps. And it just gives you another perspective to the literature. So, you know, this is something that you could, you could make one of these yourself. If you have older students, they could make one together with another class. It's not hard to do. There are directions on Jerome's website. It is a little time consuming. Um, but I love what he's done with that. Uh, Valerie Becker is a retired Apple Distinguished Educator friend of mine. And the reason I put her slides in here is that she very often um, created projects where the kids would paint something or draw something, and then she would digitize it and turn it into a movie. You may want to think about how you can take the authentic and turn it into the digital to share with other people. She also would go and, because she taught on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off of Massachusetts, it used to be a whaling community, she would do projects with like whaling communities around the world as they studied the history of Martha's Vineyard. And so she would go into my Global Education Conference website and look for people from Iceland and people from Japan where whaling is still a way of life. And then they would do global projects together. Martha's, Martha's Vineyard also has um, lighthouses. And so she would also go looking for other communities that have lighthouses and they would do projects around there. So if you can find some sort of local theme and to compare and contrast with people around the world, I think that's also another really interesting angle with global projects. So these things are old. Uh, Valerie's probably been retired for two years now, but I love the work that she's done. Um, David Cawthon, Cawthon and David Grant, or Matt Cawthon and David Grant are two Apple Distinguished Educators who do a collaborative book with high school students, and then they publish this book on Blurb, and um, I think they raise money for charity or something like that, and it differs every year. Matt is based in California, and I believe David is at an international school in China. And then this is like the ultimate project, which is no longer existing, but I want to talk about it because I think it's like the ultimate in sophistication of project-based learning. Carl Fish is the tech director in Colorado, and he's helped his English teachers. And I, I kind of wonder what's happened if they've morphed beyond this since, um, since 2011 when this project, I think, ended. Uh, they have a wiki that housed all their materials for um, A Whole New Mind, a book by Dan Pink. Freshmen, um, which are ninth graders or 14, 15 year old kids, would read A Whole New Mind, which talks about these mindsets and, and skills that people need to have in this new world. And they would take a chapter and really dive into it, and they'd, they'd use kind of a Socratic method of uh, fishbowl method, where the, the kids were talking amongst, one circle of kids was talking amongst themselves about the book with an adult, um, you, and they brought in like kind of, you know, local politicians or the principal or somebody of some stature. And, and, and had them be part of that. And then there was an outer circle of kids who were writing about what they were listening to from the inner circle. And then they had adults, Carl would invite friends of his from online to live blog with the outer circle kids. So there was actually a third circle kind of around everybody. And it was pretty cool and pretty sophisticated and took a lot of planning between Carl and the two English teachers. Um, and, the, and, the, and the amazing thing too about this is that they brought Dan Pink, the author, in to um, to do one chapter with the kids. So think about, too, about what kind of experts or, you know, you know people of significance that you know that you could tap into to, to do some sort of extraordinary experience for your kids. You never know. And you never know if you, ask, if you don't ask either. A um, couple other things that I think are really great. I love this one. It's called Out of Eden Learn. This is about a National Geographic fellow who is a journalist. His name is Paul Salopek. And he's walking around the world from the cradle of mankind in, in Ethiopia to South America. And um, I think he has to take a boat at some point. And I don't know where he is exactly right now, but you can follow his stuff on National Geographic. And there's an education community that's built around this. And you can practice some of the things that he's doing. He's trying to do slow journalism, taking in the community, um, you know, and that sort of thing, and, and, and really appreciating the small things in life, kind of, I guess is the way I would describe it. So there's a whole community that's run out of Harvard's Project Zero that teachers can participate in. Yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing, amazing, amazing human being. And here's a trailer that you can look at on your own time of Paul. Here he, here he is uh, walking in Kenya. 
Um, this is a keynote that we had at the Global Education Conference a year ago, and, and just take a look at it sometime. Robert Fogarty takes pictures of people that have written like on their on their arms a message. Um, and this is a couple years ago. He went to Syria. We, I think you know, probably at the start of all of this stuff, and took pictures of of Syrians. And it's um, it actually he might have been in Jordanian refugee camps. I'm not sure, but that's kind of a cool project. And I wonder how it could be mimicked in classrooms as well. And then of course. You know, I, I think this is here. Um, Google, uh, Google Expeditions are go, using Google Cardboard. You can take these incredible virtual tours. I saw one this spring of the Great Barrier Reef, and it can be kind of teacher directed through these devices. And a lot of people think virtual reality has a lot of potential. I'm not, so, you know, people think this is going to be, you know, this is going to change education. I'm not so sure. I think it provides a window to places in the world, and that's important. But I don't, I don't see this as a super deep. Um, usage of technology, in all honesty. I think it's cool, um, but I'd like to see something that's a little bit more deep. Global Nomads, which is another group, um, has, is producing five global stories that are in virtual reality this spring, and they're launching them, I believe, at South by Southwest, which is a conference, EDU, which is a conference in Texas uh, in March. And I had the opportunity to partake one of theirs when I went to visit their offices. And I put on the goggles and headphones, and I was in a story told by a little girl in a Jordanian refugee camp. Um, and I toured her house and her, met her family in this, in this story and saw where she went to school. It was phenomenal. So I think that is pretty powerful. If you can take you to places, it really, I felt like I was in the room. It was really immersive. And so... I think that's the future of virtual reality. Um, I mentioned LuminEd earlier, which is my student Henry, Henry Harbo's project um, that connects classrooms to India, and he's looking for more people to, to get involved with that. And then finally, if none of this floats your boat and, and, you, and you are still looking for more things, um, you need to think about you know, connecting to a community like IRON. IRON has been a big supporter of our conference for a number of years. And they have a project book that they publish every year of ideas. And, um, and they bring teachers from all over the world together to work on these projects. If you join your community, I believe that there's a fee. It's not terribly expensive. So I would highly, and you can get a school license fairly cheap if everybody wants to participate in it. But this is a really good place. Um, for you know existing things and the automatic connections to other places around the world, some teachers are able to do that on their own. I think if you're in this room, you, you, maybe you already have made those global connections for yourself, and you don't need a community wrapped around you like this necessarily. But um, this makes it this is one-stop shopping. This makes it a lot easier uh, to get teachers on board if you're part of some sort of community like this as well. So we're big fans of Iron. Um, in the chat, if you know of any other projects, throw them in there. I'm going to keep going and just talk about what. If you know of any other projects that you think are amazing, throw them into the chat. And if there are any tools that you think are amazing, throw them into the chat because I'm going to like whiz through this next part. You need to have some sort of toolkit. And you know, I'm an Apple fan, so I use Photo Booth and FaceTime and GarageBand and things like that. Um, to record and talk to people and, and that sort of thing. And, and generically, <clears throat> you need some sort of chat client. This is kind of old school now, but um, I've had this, this slide in this kind of presentation for a long time. Um, but you definitely need you, you definitely need some way to a webcam, some way to communicate with people. You definitely need um, a digital home base. You definitely need, and that could be a collaborative workspace such as Edmodo or Google Sites or Wikispaces. You need a network, whether you develop it yourself or you join in IRON or Taking It Global or whatever, or a conference. Our conference is a good place to find those friends. And then Web 2.0 tools, which I don't think we should, do we still even call them Web 2.0 tools? Um, but they have Padlet and Flipgrid and all those things that we've talked about today. Um, I love some more. Yes, I love some more. And my new thing, Carol, um, is TACK, T-A-C-K-K. I use that all the time as well. Um, here's a Go Global Kit from VIS International Education, which is another partner of ours. Lots of good stuff in there if you want to dig through that. Um, and then these are some of the kinds of starting points that I point people to when they're trying to, to, to start. Um, and in the slides, if you click on the IRON logo, it will take you to IRON and so on and so forth. 
Uh, Connected Educators Month is another place to build relationships necessary for project-based learning. And then, of course, I think Julie might mention this, there is a PLN award now from ISTE for people who are doing online global collaboration, and that's really important for people to know. Um, and then finally, my, my parting words to you are, you need to build pro professional relationships around this stuff in order to really develop authentic um, projects. If you aren't connected to people, um, the chances of people following through on what they need to do in a project are, are minimized. Um, and, and people are feel are, will be more invested and more proactive if you are finding a friend or a group that you can connect to in order to develop a project. I also recommend if you're just starting out with this, join an existing project. You don't have to be, you know, super, you know design something super sophisticated that's going to consume your entire life. You know, join Jenna Wagner's projects or join Carolyn and Mary's projects. And the other thing I wanted to mention too is a lot of projects I mentioned were very US centric. Um, and I would love to know more projects that are not in general. So if anybody has suggestions, let me know. I know Anne's Hello Little Skypers gets together and does certain things. So more details about that would be helpful for me. Um, I know that you guys communicate a lot, but I'm not sure what the projects are that you actually work on. So that would be helpful to me. Um, and then you know, keep this simple. You know, you don't have to do this all year, all the time. You know, the Global Read Aloud, for instance, is just a certain part of the year. Um, you, you don't need to, to, to go, you know, feel like you have to do everything all the time. And then finally, just try to evolve your practice over the years. You know, take on something new once you've mastered something, and then we'll go from there. All right, I'm going to stop for a second. And Ness, do you want to throw out some questions to me? And the slides and resources are up here. Uh, Paul had a question for you, Lucy. Um, do you, the question was, do you have yeah. chil children initiated My projects? Um, in, in terms of, of, in my examples, or do I, do we host them ourselves? Okay, in the examples. So the kind of, so I would say that the, the place to look for examples of children initiated projects would be someplace like the Challenge Based Learning site on Apple's website. Um, I don't know if they have any examples up there right now, but that's really student focused and student oriented. It's about kids coming up with a problem to solve, not the adults. So that's what I would look for. The other kind of place I would look at is like taking it global, particularly for, you know, middle to upper grade students, um, which has, you know, different kinds of activities and initiatives that are in a social network to support it, uh, built or, uh, you know, and activities built around different kinds of issues such as climate change and that sort of thing. So those are some examples of, of, of what I would look at for that sort of thing. Uh, okay, great. Hopefully that helps you answer your question, Paul. If you have any other questions for me, feel free. I know we need to get going here because you have other sessions going on. Feel free to go into Edmodo and um, post a question in there, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. But we'd love to have you join the Global Education Conference Network, and that's a place that you can also post any projects you want to do and keep an eye on our discussion forum for anything that other people post as well. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for this opportunity. And if you have any questions, you can find me on Twitter, or you can join Edmodo, and I'll be happy to address your questions there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was just a whirlwind of fabulous ideas and resources and tools and all kinds of things. So hopefully everyone will be able to find them on the Edmodo site. And want to thank all of you for joining us. And want to remind you all to be sure to log out of the room so that the recording will process. And we'll be able to share that link with our friends and colleagues as soon as it gets published. So thank you all for coming. And we'll see you in the next session, which is uh, Julie Lindsay's keynote, I believe, on Thursday in the U.S. could be Friday in Australia. Great to be here with all of you. Bye and thanks.